One race down, 22 to go. Red Bull were rampant in Bahrain, securing the 1-2. However, just behind them, the battle to be best of the rest is hotting up. Do Ferrari and Mercedes have a new challenger in Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso? This is the Sky Sports F1 podcast. Hello everyone, uh, I hope you're well. Uh, welcome to this week's podcast. We have some new debutantes uh, on the podcast this week. So alongside me, a man who needs no introduction, Simon Lazenby, F1 presenter, uh, F1 analyst, Naomi Schiff, and returning to the pod, our analyst, Karine Chandog. Hello all. Hi. Hello, hello, Matt. hello, 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 hello. Nice to see your hair game is as strong as as, as in episode Thank you. one. Still, still holding on to that second best position. Yeah, in the Nico Holkenberg, just one or two steps away. <laughs> um, but look, uh, yeah. Naomi and Simon, you were in Bahrain. Simon, start with you. How was it? You, how many Bahrain? How many first races have you done now with Sky F One? What eleven? Yeah, no, I think this is twelve. Now, I think this is the twelfth one. So, first year was two thousand and twelve. So if you if it goes inclusive, then yeah, twelve. And so yeah, it's good. Back in the desert with with gnomes and Nico and uh, the whole gang. Sadly, Karun wasn't there, but I can't wait to see him in Saudi Arabia. That will be uh, that will be an absolute pleasure. I'll give yeah, you a big yeah. cuddle when I see you. Miss We're going to kebab together. Yeah, I've, I've heard you did some exploratory stuff on the Formula E the other day in terms of kebabs. So what? Yeah, I'm looking forward to coming. Getting a bit, yeah. bit of those going down in uh, in Jeddah, all over my shoes. I look forward <laughs> oh, to sorry, it. Yeah, uh, no, question, yeah. Sorry, whoa, 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 hold on. I didn't <laughs> ask the question, did I? Yeah, Bahrain was good, Matt. It was great. It was fun. It, you know, look, let's face it. Red Bull, dominant. It's kind of like from the neutral's perspective, it's going to be, uh, we're just hoping that somebody can take the fight to them. But um, Fernando Boyd us all, didn't he, Gnomes? He did, he did. I mean, this weekend was a bit of a roller coaster. I'm sure we're going to get into it. But um, just to share some thoughts as well on the first race of the season, this is not my 12th, only my second with Sky. So still as exciting as it was last year. I guess last year was slightly more, I'd like to say, you know, we weren't exactly sure what was going to happen. Brand new regulations last year. So there was a lot more things up in the air wondering what would happen this year obviously the cars are just an evolution of last year's cars but still some teams took us by surprise so that's been really great to see and yeah this weekend was very exciting um i will say simon did spill kebab all over his shoes in bahrain as well so he's not gonna have to wait until Saudi for that yeah. <laughs> standard yeah. well there were those white ones because i saw him rocking some trendy you know early 20 year old white ones in a very mm-hmm. justin bieber exactly. Friday. So, those are the ones yeah. New season, new threads, I think, is yeah. probably the, the, the thing. <laughs> Karine, where did you watch the race? Uh, I, I was at home. Uh, my, my wife has gone off uh, across the pond, so I was at home with two children under the age of four. So unfortunately, I didn't get to watch um, any of Simon and Naomi's wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, but I did manage to turn it on for the formation <laughs> lap and uh, <laughs> watch Crofty do his thing, as he does. Um, but yeah, no, I was uh, I, I enjoy watching the weekend. Very good. Do you jump and scream watching Formula One, or are you a lot more kind of? No, my son was shouting a lot because he's a big Carlos ah, Sainz fan, you. and um, uh, uh, but I was mainly saying things like "Stop spilling the popcorn" or "Don't kick your brother" <laughs> and things like that. Uh, different way of watching. Fun times, as yeah. Simon knows. <laughs> yeah. All right, so much to get into today. Uh, Thank you very much for all your responses to our question, our big question for this week's podcast. Uh, Alonso and Aston Martin, are they the new challenger to Mercedes and Ferrari? Uh, Lots to unpack. Fernando said uh, after his third place on Sunday that it was too good to be true. So the big question, Naomi, are Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso here to stay? Well, I certainly believe that they are. I can't see why they wouldn't be. Obviously, after a couple of races, we'll have a little bit more of an idea of how they fare on different types of tracks. But, you know, all throughout testing and all throughout this weekend, they were right there. Um, Not just Fernando Alonso, but Lance as well, even though he missed out on all of testing with all his injuries, despite the pain that he was in, he was still, you know, able to be in the mix with the top three teams. And I think that has a lot to say about where that car is and how strong it really is. You could see it really come alive in the race. We knew that they had some pace, but throughout the race, they kind of, um, you know, managed their tires 
even better than Ferrari and Mercedes. And that's why they were able to take the battle to them. So I think uh, they've got a, a lot of potential in that car. And if we have a development race alongside the race on track, as we did last season, then I think they'll just be able to keep up um, and make sure that they get even closer potentially to Red Bull. It's quite frightening when you think it's a customer car, isn't it? It's a customer team effectively beating the works team. And I think that's one of the things that, that got Toto so much on on Sunday and saying it was the worst, you know, the worst day of his racing career and all that is the fact that yes, he went over, he's good friends with Lawrence Stroll. Um, and so congratulated him on beating them purely on pace. But for them to just abandon the concept, we thought it might take until Imola before they abandoned it, but they threw it away after qualifying. It felt like he just was conceding defeat early and saying, look, I've had enough of this. We've got to move on. I don't know what you thought, Karun, but it was I thought it was really, really early and kind of a statement from Toto say, I've just run out of patience. I think he, they have to, though. They have to make the decision now. And, and I go back to last year. You know, it's all very well for people like Perez in the press conference to be saying, oh, it's a copycat of our, our last year's RB18. There's three bulls on the podium and, you know, everyone making these these statements. The reality is last year, they started the year Aston Martin with a mm-hmm. car that wasn't very good. They put their ego aside. They were willing to throw away the time and effort they'd invested in that and ultimately make the decision for Barcelona to produce a copycat Red Bull, upset a lot of people at Red Bull last year. But it meant that they kind of wrote off a big chunk of last season while they had to understand. When you go off and just copy something, it doesn't mean you fully understand it. You know, We've seen that with, with people like Haas before where they've had a copycat Ferrari but couldn't set it up. So Red, I think... You know, Red Bull were annoyed by it, and they're still annoyed by it. But Aston spent last year understanding the philosophy. Then they've improved on it, and they produced this car, which is based on already a strong package from last year. And I, if I look at the timeline, right, if you're going to... It's like building a, a, a block, right, of apartments. You know, think of a, a rule cycle of four years as a four-tier apartment block. Mercedes... I've got to think about, listen, do we throw away, do we knock down the first two years that we've built and build three tiers in the same time that everyone else is going to build just the last tier for next year? And that decision will have to be made now because the architecture and the layout and the concept of the car will get signed off by April for all of the teams. So where are we now? 7th of March. You know, they've got, in the next couple of races... They have to make the decision of do they abandon this concept and go with a whole new plan for next year. So I, I think Toto is right to feel tense and frustrated because clearly there's a design team there that's told him, we're going to stick with this concept. It's going to work. We've understood what went wrong last year. Let's make it happen. And Simon's absolutely made the, the point there that last year, they were saying to us, weren't they, side that they thought, oh, you know, we've got all this potential. It's untapped, mm. all this potential. Well, say, so hang on. <laughs> that's. I think that's why he's more yeah, annoyed but, but, this year than he but, was last year. Karun, the, the rear of that car, the rear of the Aston Martin, is effectively a Mercedes, isn't it? So you look at. So you look at the engine, the oh, gearbox, yeah. the yeah, hydraulics. Yeah. You know, the the rear suspension is exactly the same as. Um, you know, the Mercedes and the Aston Martin are exactly the same in that in that that area. So effectively, yeah. you know, they know that it can work with a with a roughly Red Bull concept. You know, what's come out of Dan Fellows' mind, because it has come yeah. out of his mind, and Crofty and I went to see him on, exactly. on Saturday night, and he was talking about the fact that it was just, you know, it, you know, you can't unsee what he saw as chief, chief aerodynamicist at Red yeah, Bull. Yeah, so. exactly. Oh, I'll tell you all the time, and the other thing is that, they, they also rent the wind tunnel, don't they, from Mercedes? So, you know, you can't really go to the old, uh, our wind tunnel belt is slipping a bit and we're getting some correlation issues, which other teams have had, because clearly yeah. the Mercedes tunnel is fine. I think perhaps the this can be summed up as well, that perhaps the excitement this weekend, Nomi, uh, in the fact that we now have someone else coming coming to the party. I mean, Aaron on Twitter, uh, who replied to, our, replied to our message, said, it's great to see another team fighting for a change, and it's good to see Alonso back on the podium. I guess that ultimately is why everyone is getting so excited about this. Totally. I mean, I think over the winter, I can say at least for myself, I don't know about you guys, that my hopes over the winter was that we would have a three-way battle at the front of the grid 
And in my mind, that was Red Bull, Ferrari and Mercedes because they're just our usual suspects. And I guess you can say Aston Martin have totally thrown a spanner in the works. I didn't see it coming. I don't know if you guys did, but um, it was definitely exciting to see, you know, new faces at the front, not necessarily new. And Fernando's obviously been there before, but in recent times, we haven't seen him or Lance being really involved in the mix like that. So just to have a new team and also not just... Uh, from the driver's perspective, but from the other, the rest of the ecosystem at Aston Martin, seeing new faces, speaking to new people, it's exciting for us. And I'm sure that it's exciting for the viewers at home as well. Yeah. Let's cast our mind back to silly season last summer when Alonso signed for Aston Martin. He, he obviously saw something in that team. I mean, Simon, j- just try and... For, for our listeners at home, just try and put us back in that moment at the beginning of August when he signed. And there were quite a few raised eyebrows, weren't there, when he actually made that decision? Yeah, because, I mean, it was nowhere near it, was it? I mean, it was it was miles off where they are this year. If you, if you look at the gap, or well, I think the difference between um, what happened in qualifying last year in Bahrain and what happened in qualifying this year in Bahrain for Aston Martin... They are by a long way that the biggest gain is it's something like 2.4 seconds is, is is the difference between last year and this year. And as Karun was talking um, about just a little bit earlier, the, the fact was that it was this B-spec car that came in around May time of last year. And then you got the influence of this dream team of designers that Lawrence has put together. So it, it's not just Dan Fallows, right, who, who'd come across from Red Bull. You had Eric Blondin, I think we pronounce it Blondin, um, he was the deputy type tech director. I mean, he, he was chief aero guy at Mercedes for five years up until um, the middle of, of, of last year. It's Luca Fabato as well, who was ex-Alfa Romeo. And when we were talking to Dan Fallows on, on Saturday night, Crofty and I, he was saying, like, it's not just me. It's lots of things. It's lots of different people coming across into, the, into creating this kind of super group that Lawrence wanted to put together. And I think it was that and the overall vision that Fernando was talking about that, that, that attracted him there. Probably, you know, 15 million quid as well might have swung, swung, swung it in his favour and a longer, a longer contract because that was, that was the point. He wanted to go there and he wanted to continue racing for a while. And wow, you know, what a decision it looks like now. And what, I mean... This is the thing, right? You know, that whole process could have been avoided by Alpine. If the, they, they were dragging it out because they didn't, they were so concerned that in two years' time, he'd be too old that they dragged the whole thing out. And they didn't want to offer him a two year deal up front, which is what he wanted. And, um, and, you know, listen, he's come out the big winner, hasn't he, out of that entire saga? Poor old Oscars in a McLaren on the back row of the grid. Um, on nearly the back row. And then Alpe had Gasly on the back row of the grid. Okay, he came through in the race, but mm. Fernando's the big winner lost. for a change. I mean, how many times has he got it wrong? Totally, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I mean, should we... I wonder if it's worth just going through that for, for people and just reminding everyone uh, of his journey. You know, obviously he won his two championships with Renault, but then he, he all of those decisions, Karun, since have been, have been... They haven't led to championships. Let's put it like that. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a few key ones, right? Like, um, I think the the fallout with Lewis in 2007, you know, where they fell out so spectacularly there and basically gifted Kimi that title, um, you know, took him away from McLaren. And, and McLaren then, Lewis won the championship in 2008. So that's two years there where Fernando shoulda, woulda, coulda. Um, and I think Ferrari as well. When he, when he left Ferrari to go to McLaren Honda, okay, at the time Ferrari were pretty miserable um, in 2014, the first year of the hybrid, but it, it came good, wasn't it? And, you know, I think, I still believe Fernando would have won the championship in 2018 at Ferrari that year. He, you know, he was uh, very, very good and consistent and he could have delivered. So, yeah, but fair play. It's come, it's come good for him. Um, and, and I mean, thank God for him, wasn't he? That was it was the most exciting bit of the Grand Prix, <laughs> so thank God for Fernando. Naomi, I want to I want to ask you about uh, Fernando the driver, and look, I I'm going to put put you in, on track now, and I'm going to say Fernando's coming in your mirrors, like he did to Science, like he did to Hamilton uh, at the Grand Prix that uh, the weekend just gone. What are you, what's going through your head? What what, what are you thinking? It's funny because um, I think that's a very good way to put it. Because when you're on track, uh, it's a lot about 
demeanor and body language. And there are some drivers that you know you'll have a clean battle with. There's some drivers you know you need to worry about. There's some drivers <laughs> you know you need to be scared of. And I think Fernando is definitely one of those drivers that you have to give a lot of respect to. And you know that he's kind of the guy you wouldn't want to play chess with because he's always three steps ahead. And that's just in everything he's thinking about when he's in the car. But he he knows where to put his car. He knows exactly where to make the moves. He knows exactly how to defend. I mean, to be fair, he spent over two decades in the sport. So um, he's collected an, an insane amount of experience, which obviously is the most important thing. Seat time um, trumps everything else. But, you know, he's also just a very special driver. And I think that every now and again, you get these kinds of drivers in all sorts of categories that just really stand out. And Fernando is most certainly one of those. So um, I just like to say I wouldn't want to see Fernando coming up in my in my mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. And and Simon, what about, I mean, Naomi mentioned it there, we you know with almost two decades of experience in Formula One, he's not only bringing him himself as a driver, but he's bringing his credentials as a someone who, who knows Formula One cars really well. He can provide great feedback to engineers and that whole process can be more streamlined. Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's no one better. We're talking about Fernando being a happy driver when he's got a good car, but I also think he... You know, he, he's just, he's always effective. Whatever he does, he, he he will drag the best, his level best out of that car. You know what you're going to get. I still think if you shoved everybody in equal machinery, I don't know what you think, Naomi, Karun, on this one, but I can't see him being far off Lewis or far off Max Verstappen. I think I think Max might, might just take that. I think he's pound for pound the best driver on the grid, but I think Fernando has been operating at that level for 20 years. You know, he's, he's won a couple of more. He's won... He's won the World Endurance Championship. He's won two titles. You know, he's been around the sport since 2001. You know what you're going to get with him. I lo- I, I've, always liked, I've always liked the fact he kind of relishes being the underdog too. He's had loads of underdog drives. I, I think in our very first year doing this, I think in Valencia, I think I remember him, like, I, yes, he had a bit of luck, but he raced from something like 11th to, to take, a, take a win. He's just, he's just cool and he just gets it. And he knows exactly how to get the best out of the car. hundred percent. And I think that's exactly what we want to see. And when you say, you know, if they all had equal equipment, who would come out on top? Um, obviously, the equipment is not exactly the same between the teams we're talking about and the drivers we're talking about. But this is the battle we want to see. Who's going to outsmart who on track? Max, as you say, is obviously another one of those drivers that's just, uh, you know, a step up. So is Lewis. But... I don't know. I As much as I've grown up always looking up to Lewis and as much as I grew up on karting circuits with Max, knowing that Max would win everything, I think Fernando might just trump them in the sense that he's so much more mature. He's been in it for so, so, so long. Um, I think even last year we could see it in the Alpine that there were moments that he was just extracting the absolute maximum out of that car. And in an on-track battle, he always gets the one up somehow he's just always knows exactly where to put his car um so yeah i mean in my ideal world i'd love to see them all in one team and see uh you know who who comes up on top because there's a few drivers who i would say i'm the kind of driver who needs a car around me that really works like good great setup i need a i need a good car a good setup i need the car to be doing what i want to do for me to have confidence in it but there's some drivers who could drive a wheelbarrow foss around the track and those three are definitely those types of drivers so let's give them some wheelbarrows and let's see who can that make sounds like a, a sky f1 feature if ever i've heard one for silverstone you tell, i tell you what the, the, the other thing is to your point there Nobi, about this weekend and exactly about what kind of summed up Fernando Alonso is that they didn't actually, the Aston Martins, have the straight line speed of the Ferrari, the Red Bull, even the Mercedes. So he didn't get his overtaking done where you'd expect it to be, sort of turn one, turn four. I think he was kind of, he, he said in his own, he had to get creative and he did it like turn 10, turn 11. And mm-hmm. and that was, I think, just race craft and a guy that just knows, as you, as you just said there, how to position the car. Karun, what about the fact that I think he just had a lot of fun on Sunday. Yeah. You know, that was evident, I think, in the team radio calls. It was evident with the smile on his face afterwards when he spoke to Nat. Is is that part of it? He's just enjoying himself? Yeah, but this is a guy who 
just loves racing. He loves driving. You know, in his days off, he's at his own go kart track, driving around with the fifteen year old kids in his academy. That it's that's what he gets a buzz out of day in day out. Um, you know, he's you know Fernando's not someone who goes home to his wife and kids and has a has a quiet life in in Switzerland. You know, this is a guy who who thrives on being in a race car or a cart or whatever day in day out. And he, I think he he was. Um, it was part part relief, I think, because you know when you go into a new team, into a new season, and a new challenge, you don't fully know how it's going to play out till the first Grand Prix. Um, so I imagine there was some element of relief that actually all of that potential is is true and it's all played out. Uh, and the other part is is the you know as you say the the joy of success because he had a he had a brilliant race. Penny for the thoughts, Simon of Sebastian Vettel leaving Aston Martin last year? Well, I mean, if you're Sebastian Vettel, you're thinking, what on earth have I done? What on earth have I done? I mean, he'll be sitting there probably thinking to himself, that could have been me. Um, but I think he was just, I, I don't know, I, I, maybe I got the impression that from Lawrence's perspective too, if someone like Fernando comes onto the open market, you're just going to, you just want to snap him up, don't you? Yeah. you just, you're just going to go for it. I mean, I think I... Uh, it's all sweetness and light now and he's saying all the right things but Fernando's brilliant at that to start with I just wonder if you know if if he'll maintain that level of optimism uh, as the season goes on certainly if the car's right up there it, it, it yeah happy Alonso as I said is a man who gets the job done so they need to keep him sweet yeah Naomi I was going to ask you about this in terms of the the, the relationship between uh between Lance and Fernando and how you know let's be honest Lance's dad is paying the wages of of Fernando. So how if if Fernando keeps beating Lance throughout the season, we don't obviously know that that's going to happen. But if he does, that's going to be quite an interesting one to watch, isn't it? Uh, over the more season. importantly, if if Lance brings the battle to to Alonso, what will that look like? But mm. I mean, I guess it's it's very challenging. It's a situation that he's going to have to. Uh, manage very well because you know we've seen Fernando we've heard him before on the radio upset with other drivers on on track we saw it almost happen uh, yesterday well, not yesterday sorry two days ago now um, when Lance accidentally you know just outbreaks himself and 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 clipped the rear of Alonso and he was on the radio constantly saying I've been hit I've been hit have the penalty been issued and I think he didn't realize in that moment that it was Lance um, he spent all weekend praising Lance and I think that probably has something to do with the dynamic at the team. Um, but it's going to be definitely one to watch out for because, um, you know, Lance is obviously a lot younger. It's only his seventh season versus, you know, Alonso's 23rd season in Formula One. So I think he'll put his arm around him a little bit. Um, I also believe, I don't know what you guys think, that this might be the team where Fernando um, retires. So I think it's also about, you know, what legacy he wants to leave for himself, how he wants to be seen. Um, I think he hasn't always had the best reputation in terms of how he works within a team. Um, I guess his sort of quote unquote selfishness as a driver, which I personally think is something that all drivers need to have to some extent. Um, but he obviously hasn't had a great reputation with that in the past. I think it's going to be something he's going to be quite conscious of um, in his last stint. Um, but especially even more so now that, you know, his teammate's father owns the team, uh, which is a, you know, I did a quite, it. quite an awkward dynamic, I would say. No, but he, that when he came in, Lawrence, at the end, and the first thing he said, it is, I, I love his drawl, the way, the way that Lawrence speaks. And he goes, you know, I'm just proud of my son. You know, <laughs> and that was the first thing. I mean, Alonso's got the podium, but it was a great story, right? He's broken his wrist. He admitted this to us first time and a toe, and he gets in and he does that, I think, reputationally, this is the most important weekend of, of Lance's career. Because, yeah. you know, it just shows a lot about his character, which I think was doubted before, perhaps unfairly. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, maybe sometimes he just doesn't come across extremely motivated. But I think this weekend he proved he proved that he was very motivated and that he was going to do everything it took to get back in the car, uh, despite the condition that he was in. And from what he told us, he even shed a tear, you know, after that touch with with Alonso. He obviously had quite a lot of lock on the steering 
and he shed a tear that's how much pain he was in so for him to do the entire race because I was obviously the longest stint all weekend um and to finish sixth you know hats off that's that's a big achievement and I can understand why daddy stroll is very proud of him I've got a couple of uh, tweets here just about I want to throw it forward really and just look at how Aston are going to evolve over the season um this is Hamish on Instagram. After the next two races at different circuits, it will be clear where Aston Martin stands. They made a huge step forward. Go, Fernando. So, Karun, what what are your expectations in terms of... Because obviously, you know, we know Mercedes, we know Ferrari are going to be on the development train. They are going to be wanting to get these cars up to scratch as, as quickly as possible throughout the season. Do Aston Martin also have that capability? And will they also be able to challenge going forward, uh, you know, consistently across the season? I, I'm i more concerned for Mercedes, if I'm honest, um, out of the two teams you mentioned. I, I, I do think Ferrari, the circuit in Bahrain wasn't, wasn't good for them uh, as a track layout. You know, this is a, a circuit with very high rear tyre wear. Um, and they, they had a car that was too biased for one lap, essentially. They had, and as soon as the tyres start to wear, they get, you know, they start, start to slide around. And, and, and I, don't, I don't fully buy... The, um, the the sort of comments coming out of the team that they got the setup wrong and they were as fast on the first stint and they just couldn't get the time because at the end of the day on the first stint, Max pulled away at an average of 0.68 per lap. So that's still nearly seven tenths a lap, um, which which is a hell of a lot. So, but I think Jeddah, which is a, a less abrasive surface, a circuit which doesn't uh, hurt the rear tires as much, will just bring the balance back to us, Ferrari. Um, I think Carlos in particular doesn't like a car which has a, an unstable rear end and, and you could see how he just dropped away, didn't he? You know, at least Leclerc sort of went with Checo in the first stint and Carlos just, he was sort of 10, 12 seconds back. So I think they will be in better shape in, in Jeddah and Australia, um, two circuits where tyre wear isn't anywhere close to as bad as this. And, and same at Baku, right? You know, you got the long straights for the tyres to cool down. So they'll be back in play for the next three. My concern for Ferrari is the fact that their reliability is already looking uh, pretty shaky. You know, before the first race, they had to change the, the control electronic unit on Leclerc's car. Then the engine went pop for um, a reason I don't think has been publicly confirmed yet. Um, so, yeah, big concerns there. Mercedes just, you know, I'm surprised Toto has not been down to Simon's house and raided that booze cabinet behind him because uh, they were all looking pretty yeah. depressed, weren't they, on... On Sunday, and I, I, I just think there's no, there's no easy answer. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, I agree with you. All dynasties fall, though, don't they? I, I think that's what's happened. That I think with Mercedes, when we get into that again, without getting into what, who they've lost over the last two or three years, um, and what they've got left, having got the concept wrong and Red Bull got it, getting it right. I don't think that's, I don't think that's helped matters. You know, you lost, you've lost James Vowles, you've lost. Um, Andy Cowell, you've lost James Allison, who's gone off to the the kind of Ineos project. And then, yeah, you know, more than that, I mean, they lost like 15 engineers, didn't they, to the Red Bull powertrains project. So I think they're, it's, they're in a transitional phase. That's what, I, that's what I reckon. I mean, I know Martin made the analogy that, um, was it Ferrari? Or was he saying that Mercedes were a little bit like Liverpool? But Mercedes are definitely a team in transition. And I think, you know, you could probably liken that to, to Liverpool right now. Naomi, what about the comments from Toto this weekend? I mean, yeah, we, we said at the top, one of the worst days of racing he's ever had. He said, on Saturday, I don't think that the package is going to be competitive, competitive eventually and that they need a radical change of the car. Like, this is race one. I mean, yeah, I know. if he's saying this now, it's only going to get worse, no? And also things weren't really that bad. I mean, yes, they were very much off the pace, but that was that didn't come as a surprise throughout the weekend. We We saw that that kind of would be the case, but... I'm not sure why he felt that it was really the worst day ever. I'm pretty sure that they've had worse days. But I guess it might just be the fact that, you know... Well, when Nico yeah, and Lewis example, hit each other exhibit on all those occasions. You know, <laughs> that's just an example of where it could have been way worse. But um, I guess maybe for him it was just really that coin drop moment where it was kind of confirmed that really they were still very much on the back foot you know, didn't really make much or any progress in the winter in the winter period. Um, I guess that for them is probably what's so hard to digest at this point. Uh, I'm pretty sure they've got. I mean, Lewis 
is obviously, you know, he mentioned it um, in the exclusive with Simon, the lie detector test, that mm. he is here for his eighth title. He's waiting and he's going to stay for it. But um, for him to be in this position is not putting him in any sort of position to get that eighth title. And I'm sure that there's a lot of pressure internally from both drivers, but I guess even more so from Lewis because he's not getting any younger. He's obviously got Fernando to look up to in terms of how far you can go. <laughs> but, um, you know, the time is of the essence. And, you know, they spent an entire season struggling and being so, you know, unhappy with where they were at with the car. So to have had this whole winter period and to come back, you know, even potentially a step backwards from where they were at the last race last season, um, that I guess is what's so tough to 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 accept. And and as well as Simon said, um, especially when your customer team has managed to smash it. Lewis, he's not going to win the title this year, is he? I mean, mm. the car's just not there. So <clears throat> if by some amazing turnaround achievement he wins it they come back next year and that means you know they'll have to commit now he will be the oldest person to win a world championship since jack bravo oh, yes. where have you, you pulled that one from where have you pulled that, that one is... from eh? Big if fernando doesn't beat him to it, it though if fernando doesn't beat him to it <laughs> <laughs> you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got your background. On what, what does that say? What does that say? That's, that's my wife. That's my wife's cabinet. That's not mine. It's not mine. Jeez. I'm what crazy. about? I mean, look, this is this is crazy talk now. But what about Fernando and Lewis at Aston Martin at the at, at that team together going for a world title? Couldn't happen. It won't happen. I, I don't think that'll happen because. Hang on a second. <laughs> who, who, what do you? So, you sorry, son. Hang on. Off let's just go. Who's the other car. Come on. <laughs> why not? Come on, Baker. <laughs> why not? <laughs> Lewis really? can't win it with Mercedes. Oh, oh, He's desperate to win an eighth. He cho- He goes Aston Martin. They've made such good good progress. I'm going to go with them. Just saying. And what you're gonna you're gonna be the one to tell yeah. Lawrence to sack yeah. his son. I think I think Lewis would be more. I think Lewis would be more chat. likely to go to Ferrari in that That's case. That's right, but, no, that is right, yeah. But I don't think that he's going to leave Mercedes, to no. be fair. I think he's very much a team no, player. I, I think he's also said that he wants to, um, you know, leave his legacy there and be a part of the team, um, just like Nicky was. So I don't see him leaving last minute after all these years with the team. Don't you? Not I mean, to ask him. Not to ask him, but I do think, I wouldn't, I can't, how can you rule out um, a move to to Ferrari, if they if they stay like this, I mean, he's so desperate, isn't he? He's so desperate for that eighth that, you know, if Ferrari did manage to stay on the coattails and they were the nearest to Red Bull, I mean, at the beginning of next year, he's not put his pen to paper yet, has he, on, on, on this contract? He was definitely waiting to see um, how this year's car fared. Um, but but I think that the, the relationship, the great relationship he has with the team and with Toto will endure. It's just... I don't think you can ever rule out a move to Ferrari for for racing drivers because it's their dream, and he said it. He said it before. What about a move to Red Bull? No, can't see. It. <laughs> well, that this is the speculation yeah. that I, I was I, hoping we'd get. I'll, t- I'll tell you. I'll tell you who will be thinking about a move to Ferrari or Red Bull though is mm-hmm. young Lando Norris. Yeah. Funny, like looking at where they're at, um, and I, you know, as much Simon, you know, we were talking about in the uh, before the season about McLaren locking him in and Zach doing an amazing job of contracting him in for that um, four-year period. I do wonder, and I think if they're smart, they would have created some sort of exit clauses. Perform- you know, If, for example, McLaren don't finish in the top four of the Constructors' Championship yeah. two years in a row, is there an option for Lando to look elsewhere? Because outside of, you know, say, shall we say, traditional top three teams, um, you know, you've got Fernando and Lando are your two top drivers on the grid, aren't they? And the fact that he's fighting to even get a car into Q3, um, yeah. there's got to be a bit of frustration there, I imagine. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, the Mis- miserable just, weekend for McLaren. Awful, awful weekend. Finished plum last, six stops, topping up the pneumatic system, and then, you know, a failure for, for Oscar Piastri. Uh, in front of the Bahrainis at their second home Grand Prix. Again, you know, you've got to wait. I think they've got a big upgrade coming in in, Imola, in Baku, isn't it? I think is their, is their next big upgrade for McLaren. But 
James Key's going to be feeling a little bit of pressure, that team there at McLaren, because I just thought they were moving in the right direction. You know, Zach got the Alonso, the, the GP2 engine out of the way. The changes came in. They got rid of Boulier. You know, brought in Seidel. Seidel's gone. I mean, it's... I, I, I think they got... they. You know, I, I just saw a tweet out this morning from them saying, back home with work to do. But boy, they've got some work to do, haven't they? Because that's yeah. just... Yeah. I, I, th- I think the, the interesting thing is... You know, I remember speaking to someone at Red Bull in Brazil last year. And at the time, they were saying how on a weekly basis, they are fighting not to lose people to Aston Martin um, and some going to to Alpine. But they were really struggling to to stop people going to to Aston. But they weren't losing any people to McLaren. And And I, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? You could just see how the... You know they've had that group of people there for a period of time, um, but as you said, Simon, recently you know people like Seidel have gone. Um, I think losing Pat Fry yeah. a few years ago was a was a bit of a loss as well. I really rate Pat. I think um, what he does in terms of just just bringing a degree of calm around the team is is brilliant. Um, but yeah, you know they they need to they need to have a think, don't they? Because if um, they've got the new wind tunnel coming, which is great as a tool. But the tools are only as good as as what you put in it, which is designed by people. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to have that going hand in hand, the infrastructure along with the personnel. OK, one thing I just want to I want to talk about for this season as well is the cost cap and how the cost cap is going to influence development across the season. Uh, because, you know, already if, if teams are looking at having to completely overhaul the car, that's going to obviously cost a lot of money. And within the cost cap, that's that's going to have certain parameters and, and not be possible. I mean, Simon, how, how do you think that's going to impact this year? Well, I mean, what we do know, the early evidence is it's certainly not affected Red Bull yet. So it's not come in yet. The, the, the reduction in their wind tunnel time, which is effectively 63%. Of, of Aston Martins, who are down in seventh, they've got 100% um, as it is per se, and then it's at the, the 5% increments. I think time's going to tell on this one. And I, I think in terms of hopes for the season, we have to hope that it does start to influence or, or, or close the field up because the whole point of these regulations was that we were going to get uh, a, a closer pack. I think as far as the midfield is concerned... That's already happening to some extent. It was great to see um, so many different teams in the mix for everything kind of below um, Mercedes and Ferrari and and Aston Martin, that race for fourth. But it's that top tier. So I think, as you know, the the period after six months, effectively halfway through the season, it's reset dependent on championship order. And maybe towards the back end, um, that's when it's going to kick in and, and, and some of those might be fighting for racing might be able to get close to Red Bull. But I think that's one of the hopes that we're all clinging to is is that from the neutrals perspective, it does play a role back end. Mm. How exciting, Simon, do you think the story will be is uh, of can Max oh, win gosh. every race? That's very exciting. Well, I mean, I certainly hope for Max that that's the case for him, but I certainly hope for us that that's not the case because what are we going to talk about all season? No, I know. Naomi, yeah, we had to do it for seven years with, uh, with Mercedes, really, up until 2021. We're, we're, we're very skilled at doing this. You can change the narrative just slightly. Um, but you True. know what? Well, as you get... say, thanks to the cost cap and thanks to the new regulations, yeah. there's definitely interesting things going on besides at the front. So that's at least exciting. I mean, Williams scoring points on their first race of the season, that was also a bit of a plot twist. That, yeah, exactly. I, th- I mean, that was a great story. I think that was almost the second best story of the weekend. Don't, don't you? In that, you know, Alex Albon, there's one. You, you're talking about good drivers throughout the grid. I really hope this is a season where he at last gets a car where he can prove that, you know, on his day, again, in, in F2 and in, in karting, he was on a par with George Russell and, and Lando Norris, and I think he's, I think he's really growing in a an environment that wasn't obviously as pressured as that second Red Bull, and I, and I, I hope for his sake he could, he could do pretty well. But then again, Logan Sargent also showed that they've got a decent second driver. He was right on the tail of Alex Albon. They both had great starts to the race. That that Williams looks, um, looks really good on a Sunday. Logan was the rookie of the. Of the weekend for me. I mean, obviously, Oscar didn't really get much of a chance to show his potential during the race, but 
I think hats off to Logan Sargent. I mean, he finished the race less than 10 seconds, I think it was, behind Alex in his debut race. That's that's closer than than Carlos was to Charles and closer than, you know, Perez was to Max. So well done to him. Yeah, I think we, I think, well, I've got to put my hands up and go, because I, I didn't, I put him as a third of, third of the three rookies going into the season. And actually, he, he qualified as the best rookie ahead of De Vries and Oscar. Um, uh, Simon, did they did they seem pleasantly surprised, Williams, uh, how good they were this weekend? Or do you think they no, were actually I expecting think, that? I, I think Valsey, when you saw James Vals, and we, we all stopped to congratulate him. And it was the first time I'd seen him this year because we weren't at testing. You know, he is... A very pragmatic guy, and by all accounts, as we're coming through the airport on the way on the way back on on Sunday night, um, we were talking to Ant was talking to a couple of the Williams guys, engineers, and they just say this guy is is fantastic. He's come in with this kind of Mercedes winning mentality, um, and is just saying this isn't good enough. Even this weekend, it wasn't good enough. I think I think the expectation is that. Um, they can challenge in the midfield, particularly on a Sunday. I think they've got some work to do on their, their Saturday pace, although Alex said he could have got it into Q3, but for that issue. But I think I think they're kind of dealing with it race by race. And again, if you look at the gaps between where they were in qualifying last year and this year, I think Williams was second only in gains to Aston Martin. So that tells you enough. And, and Alex was really chuffed, wasn't he, Naomi, when he came and, came and spoke with us in Prez? Yeah, super happy, which you can only understand. I mean, having spent a season out of the car and then a season at the back of the grid, I think for someone like him, much like Lando, actually, to see a lot of his peers that he competed very closely with in F3 and F2 doing so well at the front of the grid, um, I think it's it's unmotivating to go racing when you've got a car you know can't get off the back the back of the grid. So um, I think he was obviously more surprised, I think, than, you know, the question was, were they surprised? I think they didn't expect to get into the points. So you could tell by his, you know, the way he looked, how happy he was, the smile on his face that it took him by surprise and that actually he was back in it racing, uh, at least in the midfield. Great team radio as well. When he when he got when he got his point at the end, it was brilliant. Great to hear. Any other business? Anyone? Mm. Any stories we've missed? Uh, I mean, Bottas in his classic Bottas Sauber anonymous <laughs> way sort of snuck into the points. Yeah. Like, like honestly, I I looked afterwards and I, and I saw I actually saw a tweet from him going, you know, P eight having a beer or something, and I thought I had no idea. I I, I just completely. Missed it. Classic I, Bottas under the radar with his new mullet and Tash <laughs> combo, which I think looks pretty, uh, well, quite... Go on, Simon. What do you think it looks... <laughs> Are you going to well, it looks a little, a little bit yeah, ratty, on, if I'm honest. I think he, uh, think he needs to uh, bulk <laughs> out a bit. But, uh, yeah, Solidarity with Valtteri and his, yeah. and his mullet. Well, one final yeah. thing. Esteban Ocon saw him. He was on our flight on the way, on the way back on the little hop to Dubai. <laughs> And I kind of walked up with Ant, and he was there, and we kind of, we were trying to say, "You've got to laugh." I mean, you have to laugh. It was like a bit of Schadenfreude because you know it was laughable. The fact that it was you know lined up on the he does that he lines up on the grid like that quite a lot anyway. So he thought it was hard done by there to get the five seconds, and then you know for not serving the penalty incorrectly, and then having to speed in the pit lane. Uh, to make up this time, 20 seconds. I mean, it was just a disaster for him, wasn't it? Poor Esteban Ocon. Uh, Poor right, Esteban. well, that seems like a, a good place to, to round it off. Uh, thank you very much for your company this week. Uh, and what a difference uh, all the liking and subscribing last week made. Uh, we got to number one in the podca- in the sports podcast charts. So thank you, everyone, for your liking, subscribing, following. All of that uh, makes a huge difference. So look, we're going to have to try and stay there now, aren't we? Fingers crossed. All right, guys, thank you so much for your company for the last uh, for the last hour or so. Uh, look forward to the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, which is next week. We've got a weekend off, but we will be back on the Tuesday before the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. We hope you can join us then. Thanks very much. Uh, see you later. Bye-bye. 